96.3 FM, The Source. After that last interview, I need to speak to somebody who hangs out with monks. <laughs> yeah, I need so. this. <laughs> that last one. Blah, 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 blah. How do we get those guests? We're very versatile. <clears throat> we are versatile. Boring if it was. Don't expect me thing. to not argue, though. If I disagree, mm-hmm. I'm going to argue. Sure. It's just exactly. part of what I'm going to do. Yep. August Tarak is on the phone. I hope I'm saying his name right. He works alongside the Trappist monks of Mepkin Abbey. He's a journalist, a contributor to Forbes and the BBC. He's the founder of the Self-Knowledge Symposium Foundation, which is a spiritual and educational nonprofit. He's a speaker, an award-winning author, and something pretty amazing happened to him some years ago um, on Christmas Eve, I I think, right? Mm -hmm. Um, The book is called Brother John. This is a wonderful book, by the way. Uh, A Monk, a Pilgrim, and the Purpose of life with some amazing writing and some amazing illustrations. Uh, let's see, the, the author, August Turak is on the phone. Who's the author, the uh, illustrator? Uh, Glenn Harrington. Glenn Harrington, okay. He's the uh, artist. Uh, August Turak, good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, and I hope I'm... Uh uh, 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 you know, I'm not a repeat of your last interview. It sounds like you had some uh, some excitement there. Oh, only that we disagreed politically. <laughs> well, you, you won't be able to disagree with the monks because they keep silent all the time. <laughs> uh, so, how, where are you? Where are you calling from? I'm actually. Uh, I live in Raleigh, North, uh, on a farm outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. But I actually happen to be in New York City right now. Oh, okay. Um, I'm a, my book was released. Br- Brother John was released le- yesterday. So I'm doing a publicity, some publicity stuff up here in New York and also going to a conference. Well, good for you. Wow, this is an amazing book. So this is your true story. Absolutely. That's something that happened to me back in 1996. And and can this is kind of an aside question first, which I probably should have waited for later, but it, it, I love the book, and I don't think I've ever seen a memoir or like an autobiography done in an illustrated way. It's not a children's book, by the way. I just want listeners no. to know this is beautiful in every respect. Um, how did this decision come to be that that this book is put out this way? Uh, it's a really good question. I uh, back in two thousand four, uh, I was coaching college students. And uh, one of my students challenged me with this essay contest, the Templeton Foundation. So I looked it up online, and it was called the Power of Purpose Essay Contest. It was open to previously published material to uh, professional writers. And in 3,500 words or less, you had to answer the question, what is the purpose of life? And I looked, and I said, I've never written anything for publication before. And I thought, oh, my God, I only got a week to do this, and it's been going on for two years. And but I started to take a crack at it. It was getting nowhere. Another one of my uh, students happened to buy, and he said, hey, why don't you write that story about Brother John that you like to tell us so much? So I wrote it up, sent it in, um, and lo and behold, six months later, they called me. I was the $100,000 grand prize wow. winner of the, of the Power of Purpose essay contest. That, so, the, the book, so it got republished in the best of Christian writings, the best of Catholic writings. And then I went on to become a a Forbes contributor and write another book called The Business Secrets of the Trappist Monks. But over the years, as as the essay fell into obscurity, I would still get a steady drip, drip, drip of, uh, of people saying, my God, this, this really helped me get through the death of a child. This, this essay really helped me get through a divorce or whatever. Wow, and then a wow. year ago in August, a year ago, August, a man drove 400 miles, an executive from a bank, to thank me for writing Brother John because it had gotten him through a divorce. And, and I'm sitting there on the por- my porch with this man, and I said, you know, I'm so flattered and humbled that I was able to help you in, in your hour of need. I said, on the other hand, I have a, I have a candle that's under a bushel basket. I need to. I have a moral obligation to get it out to more people so it can mm-hmm. do some good. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've been kicking around this idea. I have a 3,500 word essay. It's not long enough for a book. Well, what about an illustrated book? What about if I had paintings and, and things? Because the monastery is so breathtakingly beautiful. It's the uh, Mechan Abbey is built on uh, what was once the Henry Luth and Claire Booth Luth uh, estate. Um, and Andrew Lou started uh, Time Inc. and Sports Illustrated, et cetera. Oh. And um, so uh, you know, all I can say is the Lord sent me this guy, Glenn Harrington, and I've never met Glenn, even to this day, I've never met him. And uh, so I called my nephew in New York, uh, who works for Scholastic, the big publishing house, and I said, Jamie, I said, can you find anything out about this Glenn Harrington? He really wants oh. to do this project. 
He came back a couple of days later. He said, he's world famous. I mean, he's done all this work for us. He's done all this. He does illustrations. He does cover art. He does everything. So uh, he and I collaborated on this, and he decided to do 22 oil paintings of, from, of Mepkin Abbey. He went down there. He spent some time with the monks, and he, he did these 22 oil paintings. And as you can see, they came out terrifically uh, um uh, yeah, so the combination. It was a great about, combination. Yes, you're getting a you're getting a hundred thousand dollar essay combined with an award winning office. Oh, all I, in one book. I, I think. <laughs> I, I think. Here's what I think. I think God put you in this time slot. I know Robin had something to do with it, but I think God put you here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's perfect timing. I can't wait to hear. So tell us about Brother John. Who is Brother John? Brother John is a, uh, a monk at Mepkin Abbey, and that is the, one of the, the, the piece of what happened was, is what happened was that I, uh, a, more, a little more backstory, what happened was my college students, again, uh, convinced me to go skydiving back in 1996. Uh, and as I said in my other book, I was brave enough to jump out of an airplane and not brave enough to tell all these kids that I was too damn old to be jumping out of airplanes. So I smashed my ankle to smithereens, and I started oh. getting panic attacks. Yeah, I got panic attacks and a depression and all this stuff, and I couldn't understand where it was coming from because, you know, the doctor you know, said I was going to heal. But then I realized I was facing my mortality, and I'd been interested mm. in spirituality all my life. And now when I needed it, I didn't seem to have any. So... Uh, one of my other students uh, was spending the summer at Metkin Abbey, and he told me about it, and I decided to go down there, and I kept going back again and again. It was just like a moth to a flame. These are the, these are the men that can help me get through this dark night of the soul that I'm in. So I'm down there for three weeks over Christmas where I'm wearing a robe. You can see my there's one or two paintings of me wearing my robe in, the, in that book. And uh, on, it's Christmas Eve. You get up at 3 o'clock in the morning at the monastery. You go to church eight times a day. You work. And then you go to bed at 8 o'clock to get up at 3 in the morning again. Well, on Christmas Eve, you do all the same stuff, except you don't go to bed because you go to, uh, mm -hmm. to Christmas Mass, and then there's a little party afterwards. So I go to this little party. I'm dead on my feet. I've been up since 3 in the morning. I head for the door. i got a several hundred-yard walk. When suddenly I realize the rain is pouring down. It's 38 degrees outside. And I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm going to be drenched, and this is the only habit I have to wear. And when I open the door, though, the light pours out from the... And there's a man standing under an umbrella, and I see it's Brother John. I said, Brother John, what are you doing standing out here? And he said, I'm here in case anybody who forgot their umbrella so that I can walk them back to their rooms. Wow, wow. And so Brother John is a man who had been 40 years in the monastery getting up at 3 in the morning, and he got up at 2.30 to make the coffee. He's one of the hardest working monks, and he gets one chance a year to go to a little Christmas party, and he'd rather stand outside in the rain in case somebody needs a walk. Mm -hmm. Now, where does that come from? Where does that motivation, where does that love, where does that peace, where does that joy come from? And that's, what I, that's how I got into the essay and how it taught me the purpose of life. Wow. And I hate to ask you, what is the purpose of life? But Well, I, 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 the purpose of life is, uh, is self-transcendent. We're, we're, we don't have, you know, people keep asking me in interviews, you know, how did I find my purpose? It's not my purpose. It's not your purpose. It's everybody's purpose. Mm -hmm. we're, here, we're here to become the best human being we can possibly be. And that means working on that every single day of our lives and, and keeping that foremost in, in yeah. our thought. I later define it in my, my other book as every human being is here on earth to be transformed from a selfish person to a selfless person. Right. Oh, my gosh. I think that is so right. I, I often think this, that the only reason we're given human bodies and mortality in the first place is because it, it is what is necessary in order to learn. I don't know if I'm right or not. It's just a thought. I think I think you're absolutely right. So you're not if you're if you're caught on an argument, you're not going to get one. From no, me. no, I, I don't. I didn't. I, <laughs> I, I had enough in the last interview. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm argued out. I can't argue anymore. No, but I, I truly believe this. I, you know, and I don't mean to, to to question anybody's beliefs in anything. But whenever I've like I've stumbled on some near death experience videos. And people who are believable, not trying to sell a book, but just people who went to a conference or whatever and were talking. I, I listen to them, and I think they're telling the truth. And it seems like the message that they all get, the takeaway, from, they all have different experiences. But the takeaway is always that we are here for each other. I, I, there's, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind. I keep repeating overly. The more successfully that you forget your selfish motivations, the more successful you will be. Um, you know, it's in your own self-interest to forget your self-interest. 
And uh, these, these are things, this applies to business, this applies to every aspect of your life. I mean, I, I talk, I'm a leadership contributor for Forbes, and I'm always talking to people about leadership. I said, you know, you guys are all wrong. You all want to become leaders because you want to become more successful yourself. You want to get promotions, et cetera. The purpose of leadership is not to make you successful. The purpose of, is for you to help somebody. Oh, my gosh. Will you run for president, please? Yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I, I said, and, it, and I said to them, the, but the irony is, or the paradox is, that the more successful you are at making other people successful, the faster you will get promoted. Yeah, no, so you're, a, I believe a, you're absolutely right. Yeah, and I believe that's a, that's a a spiritual thing or a God thing. I don't know how else. Absolutely, I, I I say again and again. You know, you can take it, and I'm not pushing anything on anybody. So if you want to take this literally, you can take it literally. If you want to say it as a metaphor, please take it as a metaphor. But seek first the kingdom of heaven, and everything else will take care of itself. Uh, what kind of uh, work did uh, you do with the monks, and what kind of work do they do? Aren't they? Um, uh, don't they have a, uh, a vow of silence among them? Well, they t- actually they're, they, they don't, their vow of silence has been relaxed since Vatican II, so they're certainly by no means loquacious. <laughs> oh, okay. But are, are garrulous to use two five letter. Uh, Fifty cent words, mm-hmm. but uh, but they do do some. Uh, they do talk when they when they need, need need to for their business, etc. Um, and they have relaxed. Uh, one, there's one hour a day where you know you can have chats on Sunday afternoons. They we chat, etc. But uh, my work, I originally when I've been going down there since 1996, so I've been going over 20 years now. And originally they had 40,000 chickens, and I worked in their egg business. And I, in my other book, Business Secrets of the Trappist Monks, I actually talk about how I worked in their business and learned and became fascinated with how successful they were and then used it in my own business to build my own businesses. But I was an entrepreneur as well and ended up selling a couple of businesses. Um, but uh, ne- then they transitioned. Now they do mushrooms. They sell exotic mushrooms to local grocery stores and the local uh, restaurants. And so my work now, when I go down there is I've been promoted to janitor. Oh, so I see. I swing a mop and clean toilets uh, for most of the time that I'm, you know, a couple of weeks ago I was on a podcast and somebody asked me, uh, well, what are you going to tell people who are stuck in these trivial, monotonous jobs? How are they going to find meaning and purpose? I said, you know, when I go to the monastery, I spend weeks with a, with a mop in my hand cleaning toilets. Mm-hmm. And I consider it a privilege to be allowed to do that. Gosh. You know, well, you are a monk in a way. Uh, the, and amazing too. By the way, I, my my father was a policeman, in in, uh-huh. in New York, and um, as a moon what do you call it, moonlighting job, mm-hmm. he wasn't supposed to moonlight, yeah. but he did. He cleaned the church, and right. and so as kids, we would help him clean the church. So the last illustration in the book is of a candle, and this is exactly what the eternal candle looked like in that church. Oh, my. So, is that, is, oh, that's is, fantastic. Is that, is that called an eternal candle, or am I just... I, I, no, I've never heard them call it anything, and I'm not saying it isn't, yeah. but I've never asked them about that particular candle, so I know exactly where it is, and it, and it certainly is burning all the time, so it very well might be their perpetual candle. It's interesting, though, that it, that's the last picture in the book. Do you know what I find encouraging, though? Oh, my gosh. And please don't – everybody in the publishing world, I don't want you to think that I think badly of the publishers. But I'm so happy that the publishers saw the value in what you have written. I'm so, I'm so glad that they say, God, this is a great piece. We should publish this. I'm, it's, 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 um, it gives me hope for, for the rest of us. Well, you know, I don't want to steal. I don't want to steal the hope. But I want to. I want to say good news and bad news. The good. The bad news is I'll start with the bad news. I self-published this book, um, so I the pub, I went and found the publisher, and uh, I I'm, I'm the one that under. Oh, really? Under- the, yes. The, the the cost and everything, and I did that. Uh, on my last book was published by Columbia uh, Business School Publishing, and I could have gone the publisher route, but. There's a number of reasons why I, I didn't, and um, I wanted to have more control, et cetera. Now, on, on the good side, what has happened is I've been unbelievably blown away. We are going to be on the cover of all kinds of the major distributors uh, like Ingram and Parable and, and Fortress and uh, all these different uh, people who supply the books to bookstores and Amazon and everything. They're putting this book, and they're also because, now it's not a Christmas book. I'm glad you, by the way, you mentioned it's not a children's book, but Brother John is also not a, a Christmas book. But mm-hmm. because it takes place on Christmas Eve, mm-hmm. it also has a Christmas tie-in. Mm-hmm. So they're putting it on the cover of their Christmas catalog. So uh, I have been extremely, uh, uh, wow. you know, 
impressed or grateful, I guess, okay. the, the response from the response from the from these jaded. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So, has been. so I've got t- three people in mind who I'm giving. Yeah, them, I'm t- for Christmas. So okay. So what I'm uh, okay. So I was wrong, but I'm in a way I'm glad I was you're wrong. Right. But you're, you're right. But you're I'm glad. But I think you're right. So the publishers turned you down. No, I never even tried. Oh, we never I even tried. I thought I wasn't going to go to the publishers. And, you know, now, first of all, let me tell you, I do everything I do through a nonprofit corporation that I set up. I, I live on a farm, and I did very well in business. I ended up selling a couple of businesses. Uh, so I don't, and I just have a funny thing. I, I've had this even before, uh, 30 years. I, I, don't, I don't have any problem with other people taking money for work that they consider, you know, spiritual or whatever, but I do. So I've never taken any money for what I consider my spiritual work. So I set up a nonprofit corporation. They own my, the rights to my books. The corporation owns. If I if I do a lecture, or if I get a, a, a you know a do consulting, if I do coaching, all that money goes into my nonprofit, and also I fund it out of my own pocket for, with other with mm-hmm. other money as as well. So, but one of the reasons I didn't want to go the publishing route is first of all you have to give up editorial control. You give up the rights, um, so you don't know how that's going to play out, and you know foreign rights, etc. But you know. You don't make any. All the money goes to them, um, even though the money is going into a nonprofit. You are still. a monk. Wow. Uh, one of your uh, messages uh, that you're telling people is that do not allow anybody to squash their entrepreneurial dreams. That is such a, a huge issue now. You know, for this election, you know, people are saying no. You can only make so much. You know, forget about the visions that that you want to be successful in life. And, and you're encouraging people to, re, you know, reach into themselves, do what they feel is best for themselves to, to make themselves grow as much as they can. And then once you do that, they can be entrepreneurial themselves and give to other people, helping them achieve their dreams. Well, you know, if you really, it, it goes down to, you're absolutely right, but it goes even to a, a, to a, a lower layer because... What I'm really arguing for in that whole essay or that whole book, Brother John, is to take a chance. You remember the part where I'm talking about the man who takes a chance on having a baby? His mm-hmm. wife wants to have a baby. He doesn't want to have a baby. All he can think of is bills and dirty diapers and no sleep and everything. And he takes the chance. He, he, he's, he's entrepreneurial. He takes the risk and he has the baby. And when the wife hands him the newborn baby, this magical transformation takes over. And suddenly the baby has given birth to a father. And now the father loves the baby so much that he can't even believe that he ever mm-hmm. had these before. <laughs> so everything in my essay is saying we have to take a chance. We have to take a risk. You know, Alan Screenspan was on CNBC a couple of days ago because he has a new book coming out. And he was talking about the job market. And he said in his whole life he's never seen a better job market. And he's 90 years old, so that's saying something. Um, but he also said he's worried that we're losing our entrepreneurial spirit in the country, that mm. that people don't want to move for a job. They don't want to, you know, and, and, and we don't want to take risks. And he said the, and he said the essential uh, thing behind the American miracle, economic miracle, according to Alan Greenspan in his book, is that our willingness to put up with creative destruction and the suffering and dislocations that that, that, that does. When yeah. Uber comes in and disrupts the uh, taxi business in New York, for example. Uh-huh. And that's the same in our personal lives. If you, you know, I just read, a, I started my essay, my book, with a quote from Flannery O'Connor. I'm a big fan of Flannery O'Connor. So I was just reading about her yesterday, and, and she said, um, uh, grace changes us, and it hurts like hell. <laughs> Oh, I love that. I love that. It's, so you have to take a chance on grace, and you have to take a chance that what's holding us all back is mm-hmm. that we realize deep down inside that we really need to make changes in our lives. You know, we really need to... when we look at creation, where everything is created by God, at least this is what I believe, and and so the human being, the the, the one creation of God that we are, is the only creation of God, as far as I can tell, that actually has to battle with itself about what it wants to do next. Uh, a dog knows what it should do next. A, a tree, <laughs> you know, it knows what it has to do next. And But we always question, what do we do next? A, a dog will never ask, should we have babies, you know? Or a tree will never say, do I need to grow another limb? And, but, uh, but people do. We say, do, should we move? Should we stay together? Should we leave each other? Whatever. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and yet, I think God is with us through all those decisions. 
I don't know. There must be something within us that makes us want to become an artist or a writer or a taxi driver or anything like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. But it also comes down to our willingness to, to take the risks. Because, there, you know, everybody, we have all, everybody and their dog is a change agent these days. And they all run around, oh, how come you're so afraid to change? Well, change is very, very scary. You know, let's t- say that I'm thinking I have a job and I'm making 150 grand a year, and I'm thinking I really want to be an entrepreneur. I really want to be an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. So I quit and I become an entrepreneur. Well, what happens if, it, if the company fails? I can't. The job for 150 grand's not there anymore. No. So right, not only right. and, and and not only have I lost the 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 entrepreneurial the job, but I've also lost the the the, illu- the illusion or the mythology that if man if things got too bad around here, I'll just quit and become an entrepreneur. So yeah, we're yeah, always yeah. we're always afraid that we'll end up in an even worse spot when we take a risk. We may, when we really talk about a fundamental change, but this is exactly you know in my essay there in that book, I go to Father Christian because I'm so disturbed about what Brother John's uh, the effect that Brother John's had. Me, he says, um, he said you can call it original sin, you can call it any darn thing you want to, but deep down inside, we all know there's something twisted. He said, in facing that fact and deciding to do something about it is the beginning of the only authentic life there is. And I think that this, you know, the, what is it that thing that's twisted? You put your finger on it. It's the, it's, it's, I, I defined it in my essay as how we are living and how we know we ought to live. Yeah. That's the fundamental twist. <laughs> you know, we have a story here in Florida, and this was years ago. Robert and I spoke to a lady, and she was painting T-shirts on the beach in New Smyrna Beach, not too far from where we are. And uh, prior to that, she worked in on Wall Street. And when, when September 11, 2001 happened, she wasn't affected by it directly. She wasn't in any of those buildings at that time. and But, but she was close enough. And she said, you know what? I never liked this job anyway. And it was a six-figure job. And she, and she quit it to come down here and paint T-shirts. I doubt that she's making six figures now, but, but the bottom line is she says it's the best decision she ever made. She's happier than she's ever been. Well, here's one, here's one for you that go along the same lines. What is the greatest thing that ever happened to me in my life in a lot of ways was, getting, was smashing my ankle in that skydiving accident. Hmm. That, dark, that dark night of the soul that, I, that it plunged me into led to a spiritual experience that I had two years later with the help of the monks, which is, has turned the rest of my life into an unbelievable joy and pleasure and peace. So um, hmm. we are oftentimes, you know, we don't realize that when God knocks us, uh, ass, as my father would say, ass over tin cups, <clears throat> that really that's a blessing. When we lose our job or when, 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 when somebody who's in a, we're in an abusive relationship and finally that person walks out on us and we feel terrible, you know, but then we realize, wait a second, the greatest thing in our life was that that person moved out on us. Um, you know, these are, uh, these, uh, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, what Kierkegaard said is that the problem with, with life is it must be lived forward and only understood backwards. A another, um, a another thing you're doing with your book is that you're helping people overcome their fear because sometimes they fear that they'll me- never measure up. And you make that statement in your book. How could you ever measure up to uh, uh, John, to Brother John? That's absolutely the, uh, the, you know, and again, I think that's what really um, holds us back is that, you know, a lot of times you think, wait a second, I can always say to myself, if things get too bad around here, um, then I'll try, or that the reason why I'm not succeeding is I've never really tried, or whatever it is. Mm. But the problem, the issue is, what happens if you try and you still fail? Not only have you failed, but you've lost the illusion that if things ever, you know, that one of these days I'm going to try. Yeah, right. So we right, end up right. we end up not trying because we're afraid of that. We're well, afraid of losing. The- yeah. It's an important part of the, the, the Jesus lesson is to have faith, and, and I think that's part of it, just have faith. I want, to, I want to throw this at you guys because I think it's really, really important. There was an article in uh, New York Magazine, um, which is not considered, the, by, by the way, a very spiritual magazine, but uh, on the opioid crisis, and it was called The Poison We Pick. And, he, and uh, what I was blew me away with about this article, and I really highly recommend it, it's called The Poison We Pick. It's so beautifully written. The guy's name is Andrew Sullivan, but he says the opioid crisis is a spiritual crisis. And I want to read you this quote. He says, quote, This nation pioneered modern life. Now epic numbers of Americans are killing themselves with opioids to escape it. To see this epidemic as simply a pharmaceutical problem is to miss something. The despair that currently makes so many want to fly away. 
Opioids are just one of the ways Americans are trying to cope with an inhuman new world where everything is flat, where communication is virtual, and where those core elements of human happiness, faith, family, community, seem to elude so many. Um, and uh, yeah, I, says, I agree. And, and another part of the essay, he says, you know, we have 80 million people on anti-anxiety and antidepressants. He said, these are the successful people. Are we then amazed when the less successful people want something stronger like heroin? Um, we, are, we are suffering from a lack of a higher meaning and a higher purpose. We don't have anything bigger than ourselves that we're living I for. love what you're saying. And, and unfortunately, we encourage people to not believe in God. We, make them, right. we, we tell them they're idiots for are believing in God or they're simple-minded or whatever. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. August, thank you for such a great interview. I love the book. Congratulations on this. I think you are right. You were hiding a candle under, what do they call it? A candle under a bushel? Yes. Bushel basket. Yeah. Basket? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I'm glad you removed the basket so we can now see the light. And I mentioned my website. Absolutely. Please. Yes. Please do that. My website is August, like the month. Turek, T is in Tom, U R A K, one word, August com, And you can find my other writings in my in my book there. Uh, and again, the book is Brother John, A Monk, A Pilgrim, and the Purpose of Life. A great book. Please, Thank you, guys. Please check, check it out, everybody. Thank you, August. Thank you for being with us today. We'll take a little break. Be right back. Yeah. 